Good morning. Welcome to the FOM Breakfast Talk. Today with us, we have Dr. Timothy William. He is no stranger to us. He graduated with MBBS degree from University of Malaya in 1995. He did his husband in Johor, and after that, he was posted to Sabah. So now he has made Sabah as his home. He obtained his MRCP in UK in 2002, and from 2008 to 2015, he was the Sabah State Infectious Disease Physician in Queens. As you all know, Plasmodium nolisa is the predominant species affecting humans in Malaysia. Timothy and his team have been working tirelessly to carefully document the clinical features of nolisa malaria, the risk factors for severe nolisa malaria, other complications of the disease, and most importantly, the best way to treat this, this dreaded disease. Tim and the team's research efforts later expanded into collaboration with scientists from many different fields and from renowned institutions like the London School of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene, the Mensa School of Health Research Darwin, Australia, University of Malaya, the Sabah Wildlife Department, University of Malaysia Sabah, and several other organizations. The results of the clinical studies were also incorporated into the World Health Organization and the Malaysian Ministry of Health Management Guidelines for Nolisai Malaria. Timothy is currently the Head of Infectious Disease, Diseases at Glen Eagles Hospital, Kota Kinabalu. He joined there from 2018. He has published more than 100 papers in peer-reviewed journals, and he was awarded the Merdeka Award in 2017 for his work on Plasmodium nolisei malaria. Uh, without further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Timothy William to take the floor, and he will be speaking to us on clinical management of nolisei malaria in the light of malaria of the light of malaria elimination. The floor is yours now, Tim. Thank you, uh, Professor Indra. Um, uh, can you all see? Um, I would like to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me to give this uh, talk on the clinical features and management of plasmodium nolisei, especially in the light of uh, malaria elimination. Now, as you all know, uh, Malaysia is actually on track in eliminating malaria. And when we say elimination, what we mean is that there is no more local transmission of malaria. So whatever malaria that we have in the country is actually imported uh, malaria. However, in Malaysia now, um, for the past more than 20 years, we have a new species of malaria that is Plasmodium nolisei which uh, presents to us with uh, clinically almost equal challenges as uh, um, the other malarias. And of course, from a public health point of view, which I won't discuss so much, uh, huge challenges in how we deal with this uh, um, type of malaria. As you can see in, in Sabah alone, if you look at the, the red uh, um, graph and the blue graph, Plasmonium vivax and Plasmonium falciparum, the numbers have been coming down steadily uh, from 2007 to 2017. And this is very encouraging because Sabah actually has the highest, has always been having had the highest number of malaria cases in Malaysia. However, if you look at the green, the green line from 2007, the number of cases of P, uh, Plasmonium nolosaya or PK in this instance has been rising over the past 10 years. And in 2017, of course, we have more data in 2018 and 19, which are not published yet. It's already exceeding more than 2000 in the year 2017. So now, since we're talking about clinical features, let's go on to the, the mortality and how dangerous this disease has 
uh, has been. And we look at the, uh, the deaths from class 1 dollar sign malaria in case 3 and systematic review. Uh, it is known to cause severe and fatal malaria and its incidence not only in Sabah, but in the whole of Southeast Asia is in, increasing. However, uh, we need, the factors associated with that uh, are not really clearly defined. So what are the factors? What, what causes people to be more likely to die of so uh, again, I have this uh, graph, as you can see, uh, fast malaria and all the side going up, fast sperm and Pyrex coming down. So all the malaria deaths in Sabah from Malaysia from 2015 to 2017, we identified them from mandatory reporting to Sabah Health Department. And we look at all the case notes and reviewed them. And, uh, and also all previously reported uh, B uh, side fatal cases in the country, not only in Sabah. The case fatality rate uh, during 2010 and 2017 were calculated using incidence data from the Sabah Department of Health. So these are the results. Uh, we had six malaria deaths occurring in Sabah during 2015 to 2017, and all from PCR confirmed penolacide. Now, what, why is it important for a malaria death? Uh, malaria death, uh, to me, is always usually an unnecessary death. It means that the patient could have been saved uh, had treatment means and other factors uh, been done. Now the median age was 40, or age between 30 to 2 to 58 years old. 67% were male, 350% uh, had significant cardiovascular comorbidities, uh, mitral stenosis, ischemic heart disease, and morbid obesity with heart failure, and one was pregnant. Delays in administering uh, appropriate therapy contributed to 3 or 50% of deaths. So as you can see, it clearly says that if we delay giving treatment and also the appropriate treatment, chances of dying were higher, 50% of them. I'll just go through a few cases. Huh? Case number one, a 32-year-old pregnant woman at 35 weeks of gestation, reduced fetal movement, fever for 14 days, abdominal pain for two days, hypotension, tachycardia, hypoxia, and tachypnea hyponatremia, thrombocytopenia, and acute kidney injury. And ventilated, we gave her IV catriazone, sodium bicarb, and anotropic support. Chest X-ray showed diffuse interstitial infiltrates consistent with acute respiratory distress syndrome. A blood, blood film was taken four hours after admission and was reported as p nolocyte at 22,400 per microliter. Oral artimeter, lumapentrine, and doxycycline were given and tertiary hospital transfer was arranged for uh, IV artisunate. However, unfortunately, the patient died while awaiting transfer and mission blood culture was negative. So this was uh, internal post-mortem examination. Uh, uh, as, uh, I won't go through it, but if you look at the, uh, there were parasitized uh, red blood cells in almost all uh, the organs. Uh, in the brain, uh, occasional microscopic uh, hemorrhage, focal edema and hemorrhages, and small, even in the brain, small blood vessels contain parasitized uh, red blood cells. So uh, the entire body, the, all the organs contain uh, PRBCs. Case number two, a 37 uh, year old female, gestational hypertension and fever, rigors, epigastric pain, dizziness, and vomiting for four days. Hypotensive tachycardia and have epigastric tenderness and diagnosed as dyspepsia, and she received ranitidine uh, and fluid resuscitation. Uh, AKI was noted two hours after admission, and IV caprioxone was commenced for presumed sepsis. So I just like just like to stress, uh, uh, these patients were not really sick for a long time. You know, only four days of fever and rigors. And think about it: how how soon usually a a, a person will actually present to a hospital and admitted after after having fever and many of these patients actually not staying near the hospital. So 12 hours, I should stack it, make a GCS drop to 9 over 15, there's severe metabolic acidosis, uh, intubation and ventilation and hemodialysis was done and she received IV bicarbonate. Uh, Imipenem was given, the blood cultures were uh, negative, we found out later. How, unfortunately, again, this patient died on day two. Blood films taken prior to that were reported as P. malare, and the counts only 2,285 per microliter, 
Admission that has been reported as B, plasmonium falciparum, no anti-malarial had been given. So this patient actually was also um, plasmodium nullus or nullus eye, yeah? but was thought to be plasmodium malaria and then later plasmodium falciparum. Three, uh, a Caucasian expatriate male with a history of ischemic heart disease. He had fever and palpitations, and this patient was uh, sick for some time, nine days. Hypotensive, hypoxic, and tachypnic. BFMP heavy infection also thought to be plasmonium falciparum. He was anemic, hyperbilirubin, and hyponatremic with AKI and metabolic acidosis. Same, same as you can see, inotropic support was given. Patients given IV artisonate and IV cap triazone, hydrocortisone, insulin infusion, cardioversion for ventricular tachycardia. He was intubated and ventilated. The BFMP data proved to be plus one nolocyte 246,000 per microliter. Day two, despite everything, his metabolic acidosis worsened. He went into coagulopathy, transaminitis with an ASA more than 4,200. And he, he was jaundiced and he also was aneuric. Day three, he died. Uh, cause of death was severe nolocyte malaria with multi-organ failure. So we looked at all the cases, uh, fatal cases of uh, plasmodium Site that was ever reported and published. So, uh, it's 302 uh, records excluded based on titles and abstract and not reporting fatal outcome 58, non human primate studies 12. So, we assessed full text uh, articles and full text articles assessed for inclusion were what, uh, 10, and studies included systemic review was 6 with 26 participants. Systemic review. Uh, these are all, all, all the cases from all, uh, all over Malaysia. There are two, 32 cases, uh, 18 of 56 percent were male, median age was 56. Cardiovascular and metabolic death was 34 percent. Microscopic misdiagnosis, 90 percent. Uh, 90 percent of them uh, had microscopic misdiagnosis, and 36 percent delay in commencing intravenous IV artesunate. So you see, there's a management. There the, are the management delays and diagnostic delays in, in these patients. Overall case fatality rate from 2010 to 2017 was 2.5 in 1,000, 6 in 1,000 for females and 1.7 in 1,000 for males, which, which is actually considered quite high, especially if we look for females, uh, 6 in 1,000 females uh, died. Uh, independent risk factors for death was female uh, sex, uh, odds ratio was 2.6, age uh, more than 45 years, uh, the odds ratio of uh, 4.7. Oh, why? There were health system issues. Delay in diagnosis of severe malaria despite compatible clinical features. So now, in order to diagnose severe malaria, it's, it is a diagnosis because patients can sometimes look deceptively not very sick uh, or deceptively uh, well. Uh, there were unavailability of IV artesunate, which is very unfortunate. Two cases, 50% of the cases were from non-citizens, so they may present late uh, and late presentation. There's long uh, duration of fever. And so this all suggests there are barriers to accessing healthcare. So conclusions, uh, these are the keys to reduce the risk of mortality. The, Patients need to present early. As you can see, uh, there's some of these patients only presented after three to four, four days, and despite that, they died. Uh, so in areas where uh, malaria is endemic, PK, uh, PK is endemic, uh, and if they get PK, even after three to four days of having the disease without being treated, the risk of dying is high. We need to be able to diagnose them rapidly and immediate administration of IV uh, intravenous artesunate. This is important, especially in many of the clinical seatans and district hospitals, and especially females, older adults, and cardiovascular uh, comorbidities. We need to be careful. So now, uh, much has been said about misdiagnosis, but it's not something very easy, actually. You can't really blame the microscopies because we've shown there are limitations of microscopy to differentiate plasmonium species in the region, co-endemic, for P falciparum, P vivax, and P nolocyte. So in Malaysia, there are three, three different types. And now there are, I think, about four. Uh, we have uh, Pasmonium cyanomolgi and a, a few others coming up. 
So uh, we, we did a, a study, we cross-checked with our local microscopists and also cross-checked with another microscopic uh, uh, microscopist. And as you can see, what is reported as uh, PF, when we did a piece, uh, 134 uh, diagnosed as PF, 110 were actually PF, but 70 were PK. And I'll go down to B, uh, and it's the same when we cross-check with a uh, with a different uh, microscopist. Uh, 144 were microscopy uh, uh, PF, but we when we did the PCR, it's 112. Now for PV, PV also is interesting. 38 were microscopy uh, diagnosed as uh, Aspergillus vivax, but only 23 was actually PV on PCR and it's the same, uh, almost the same as uh, when we cross-check with the different microscopies. Now we come to PM stroke PK. This is what uh, many hospitals have been reporting PK as. Now look, 170 were reported a microscopy PF, PM or PK, but only 94, sorry, only one, one out of these 117 that were reported as PM stroke PK was actually Plasmodium malariae. And we cross-check this with a different microscopies out of 104 that were labeled as PM from PK, only one was actually PM, whereas 94 was PK uh, in, in both microscopies, 13 were PV and 8 were reported as uh, were actually uh, PF on PCR. So I just like to say that when the microscopist thought that this was PM from PK, it was very, very, very high chance that it was actually PK and very, very low chance that it was PM. Okay, so this is important. And the importance of PF also is if that if a person diagnosed the person as having uh, Plasmodium nolosi, uh, Plasmodium nolosi, when he actually has Plasmodium falciparum, he may be treated with chloroquine instead of uh, artemisinin combination therapy. The chloroquine works well for PK, but not for PF. So this, this diagnosis, when you say it's PK, when it's actually PF, can be uh, dangerous to the patient. And also PV, when, when it's misdiagnosed as a PK, when actually it's PV, then we will not give primaquine. So this misdiagnosis has management implications. Uh, so it's not just uh, as long as we diagnose malaria, the treatment is the same. So here again, I want to stress, uh, all studies conducted in Malaysia showed similar findings. So whenever they said this PM stroke PK, most of the time it was actually plasmonium nolosi. Having said that, we don't blame the microscopist because it's not easy. Distinguishing between falciparum, vivax, and nolosite in a region where all three species fre frequently occur is challenging. However, misdiagnosis can potentially lead to inappropriate treatment, including chloroquine therapy for P. falciparum and a lack of anti relapse therapy for P. vivax. So, because of this, we have recommended a unified third stage treatment strategy for all Plasmodium species. And it's also very important, I think, University of Malaya and many universities are developing a accurate rapid diagnostic tests suitable for all species. Uh, so I mean, this includes the pathology department of UST Malaya and the use of PCR confirmation for accurate surveillance. I think you'll be having talks on this later. So the approach of treatment of, of malaria, I just did draw a, a simple chart. Do they have severe malaria? Yes or no? Yes. Then straight away give IV artesunate. No, then are they vomiting? If they are vomiting, then give IV artesunate. They are not vomiting. Is it PF or PK or PV? Now, if it's PF or PK uh, and uh, they do not have severe, you give ACT. If it's PV, you give ACT plus primaquine. We did uh, a randomized control study in Malaysia, which found almost 60% uh, of Plasmonium vivax in our country was resistant to chloroquine. So hence, now the treatment for PV is also ACT and primaquine. Now, how do we diagnose severe malaria? That's very important because many people with malaria, with severe malaria, are diagnosed as un, not severe malaria or uncomplicated malaria. So the WHO criteria for severe malaria 
I won't go through all these clinical features and biochemical uh, features. Just remember this. Uh, if a patient has malaria with one organ involvement, doesn't matter whether it's a brain or kidney or heart or respiratory sy system or cardiovascular system or, uh, or hepato hepatitis, if they have any of this involvement, then most likely they are severe malaria. So malaria with hypotension is severe malaria. Malaria with jaundice is severe malaria. Malaria with respiratory stress is severe malaria. Now the biochemical features, hypoglycemia, severe anemia, lactate more than five, renal impairment, metabolic acidosis, and hyperparastemia. So this WHO criteria for severe malaria is for all malarias, uh, especially uh, uh, E. falciparum malaria. However, uh, the definition for severe malaria and P. nolasi, as, as you saw in one patient, the, the counts were not very uh, high. So for falciparum malaria, parasite density that we, the cutoff is 100,000 per microliter. However, for P. nolasi, for P. nolasi, we, we recommended the cutoff period to be 20,000. Okay, 20,000 parasite density. So if they have more than 20,000, they should be given IV artisunate. Now these are studies, uh, 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 randomized controlled studies on uncomplicated nolsai malaria. So we compare, uh, uh, if we look at chloroquine, a prospective study done by Danny Shua, where there were no treatment failures using chloroquine. So I would stress, from the onset that chloroquine works very well for plasmodium nolosite. All right, chloroquine works very well for plasmodium nolosite. So the WHO treatment guidelines in 2015, in areas with chloroquine susceptible infections, treat adults with uncomplicated Vivex, Ovale, Malaria, nolosite with either ACT or chloroquine. So these guidelines were recommended uh, before the, the, the randomized control trials were done. And we did a randomized control trial comparing artesunate mefloquine versus chloroquine, ASMQ versus chloroquine. No treatment failures with either drug at day 42. So both drugs work well. However, there was better early therapeutic response with ASMQ, uh, artesunate mefloquine. So the parasite clearance time at 50% uh, was 3.4 was the 6.3, 8.9 hours versus 14.8. 14, 14 There's increase in clearance ring stages and increase in fever clearance, uh, 11.5 hours versus 14.8 hours. So there was actually a better early therapeutic response with ESMQ and decrease in bed occupancy, decrease in the uh, risk of neuro uh, uh, anemia at day 28. However, there was one neuropsychiatric serious adverse event with uh, ASMQ. So this study shows that uh, when you compare ASMQ to chloroquine, both, both drugs uh, both drugs work well. Uh, there are no treatment failures. However, the early therapeutic response was better in the ASMQ. Uh, but then we know that we use artemeter lumafentrin, sorry, it's already been published already. Um, the rationale, no efficacy data for artemisin uh, lumafentrin is likely better safety profile on ASMQ. So no treatment uh, failure uh, by day 42. Early, better early therapeutic response with artemisin uh, lumafentrin. So again, ACT is pre, uh, 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 Riamet or artemisin lumafentrin was actually showed an earlier response to chloroquine. So the recommendation is ACT is preferred over chloroquine for the treatment of uncomplicated plasmodium nolosite. Irrespective of the presence of chloroquine sensitive P. vivax in co areas, especially in Malaysia, as I said earlier, there are two things. Huh? In Malaysia, there's a chloroquine resistant P. vivax. That's the first factor. And the second factor is the difficulty in differentiating these different malaria species. So it's easier to use ACT because it covers all three species. So the Ministry of Health guidelines for P. nolosite, the first line is artemita lumafentrin. Alternatively, it's artemisunate and mefloquine or chloroquine. So AS, ACT is also recommended for uncomplicated P. falciparum and P. Vivex. And now we have a unified ACT guideline 
for being no side in our country. Uh, for the rationale I mentioned to you before, primoquine is not needed for PK. Yeah? P nolocyte, there are no uh, hypnozoids. Uh, for P nolocyte, gametocytes using RT PCR reduced from 85% uh, to 6% with ACT, 4% with chloroquine and this. So they all die off by themselves. And so we don't need to use primaquine for PK. <clears throat> now, treatment for severe malaria uh, it's, is intravenous or intramuscular artisanate for at least 24 hours. And then when they get tolerate orally, then we change to oral ACT. Now, this is very important. Prompt and accurate recognition of severe disease is vital. So again, I stress uh, to you, my friends, uh, my colleagues, very important to recognize severe disease. And if you are not sure, if, if you are not sure, then just give IV artisanate. Okay, if you are not sure, err on the side of caution, give IV artisanate. There's only one study, uh, retrospective study, that compared quinine with artisanate, which, which we did in uh, Queen Elizabeth Hospital. Uh, uh, it's a retrospective study, it's not a randomized controlled trial. 31% mortality with IV quinine versus 17% with IV artisanate and 0% with mortality with IV artisanate in addition to earlier distant referral and improved recognition of severe disease. We published this in 2013, where anyone with severe was referred and started on IV artisanate. So now IV artisanate is now currently recommended if the parasite count is more than 20,000 because there's a 11 fold risk of severe disease and unable to assess uh, and, and if you're unable to assess other severity. So what happens in the district hospitals in our clinic, Kasiatan, you may not be able to do a liver function test or renal function test or a chest x-ray or an ABG or see the lactate levels. So what you do is people do is they rely on the parasite count. So if it's more than 20,000, then they should be given artisanate. Uh, I stress that uh, earlier, you remember uh, for uh, plasma falciparum, it is more than 100,000. So for PK, it is more than 20,000. And then we did.